here, I'm going to start off immediately by making you a promise. And for me to make this promise, I need you to read this for the next 10 seconds. Anyone who sits on top of the largest hydrogen oxygen fueled system in the world knowing they're going to light the bottom and does not get a little worried, does not fully understand the situation. So this is what John Young said in 1981 when he was about to board the first uh, space shuttle. So I want to focus on these words, does not fully understand the situation. I'm making the promise right now that I'm going to give you the tools to understand what it really takes to understand the situation. So let's look and some of the biggest achievements that mankind has ever had. We have a lot of complex situations. Like, for example, this summer, it will have been 50 years ago that Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon for the very first time. For those of you who don't recognize this one, this is the International Space Station. It is at an altitude of about 400 kilometers above Earth, traveling at 7.5 kilometers per second at the size of a football field. Now, this is not only a technically amazing feat, but also from an international collaboration point of view, it's one of the biggest we ever had. And just in the same way, science brings people together. In CERN, we have a large Hadron Collider. This is considered one of the largest <coughs> machines that mankind has ever built. So, <clears throat> as an engineer, I don't just get um, excited about how these things work. I also wonder, how were these exactly built? So let's just talk a little bit about how we build these kinds of things. Sorry, the clicker stopped working. OK. So picture Marco, Luis, and Simon. They are three engineers that worked for a module on a module for the International Space Station. Now picture some of their colleagues. They weren't alone. But actually, if you put everyone together, these were thousands of people working together to achieve this amazing thing. But how scalable, is it, how scalable is this really? Imagine if you have more people due to more complexity of your system. So let's look back at Louise, Mark, and Simon. In between them, they have three connections. There's three possible connections for information exchange, for potential failures, and so on. Think of your own team building, uh, teamwork experiences. When you work with just a handful of people, it's relatively easy. Now, Anyway, um, oh, it's there? OK, thank you very much. Great. <laughs> so picture their immediate team. There are 13 people. This means that there are 78 potential connections between all of these people. So imagine if this scales up and you have 1,000 engineers. This is 499,500 connections. So if you scale this up, you have an immense amount of potential failure. Imagine if this guy spoke to that guy, but then he was on holidays, so he never got it. Like, there is a, a million ways that this right now could potentially go wrong. So you have different disciplines working together. So you schedule a meeting, because you have to talk about it. But then what happens is you have to send an email afterwards, because, well, not all the information in the meeting was actually super clear. So you don't get a response, but you get a call, and then what happens is you're facing a deadline and your documentation is not ready. Usually, when this happens, you make another meeting because, well, it's the fastest way we can actually exchange things uh, when we're working with different disciplines. So after meeting, you disseminate the results in another email, but then you have to call again. And interestingly, all of a sudden, your documentation is ready and you're sending it off to your client. But where do you store it to send it off to your client? And all of a sudden, the client is like, OK, but actually, I want to work on this. And which version did you actually send me? Who made those changes and why? There's a million questions you could ask yourself of what would potentially be going wrong there. I'll leave that up to your own imagination, but you get my point. I'm going to give you an example. You might recognize this from a movie, uh, Hidden Figures. <clears throat> this is where John Glenn was wondering if they could redo the calculations for his uh, first orbit around Earth. So what you see here is on the blackboard, people are collaborating and they're doing calculations together. They're all learning from it. This guy's writing documentation. This guy's making 2D drawings. Uh, and then someone's job is to actually put everything in these kind of nice classifiers and share all the files around. 
So <clears throat> nowadays, not that much has changed. We have a digital tool for drawings. We have a digital tool for exchanging all the data we have. We have digital tools for actually capturing some of the documentation. And then we have another digital tool to exchange those. So in essence, what happened is we just replaced the same methodology with a digital version of it. Now, right now, it's still the very same thing, right? So if he needs information from the documentation, and then at the same time, he needs information from the latest calculations, now, this also needs to be documented somehow. And then it needs to be shared with everyone. And then this guy is try, trying to find a very specific file to share with him. So again, imagine the amount of potential failures that we have. And not that much has changed from the 60s till now from a methodology point of view. So I'm going to give you a few reasons why we should be changing this. If you look here, it looks something, it's very tiny, right? So just a hyphen. It's considered one of the most expensive hyphens in history. Because of the lack of this hyphen, the following rocket of the Mariner 1 mission in 62 exploded about five minutes after uh, launching. This was a software problem. Another one of these is the Ariane 5. It's a European rocket, which in the end of the 90s, in 96, it had a first launch, and then it also failed due to the software being on there. So software development evolved, but hardware did not. Just as an example, again, in the end of the 90s, the Mars Orbiter, which was a very promising mission, failed due to the fact that there was a unit conversion mistake. And this is pure physics. Like, we all have different standards. We all work in different ways. And this should not be happening. But we don't have to look that much back. This is an airport which is being constructed around Berlin. And it's taken almost a decade longer than projected. And it's taken more than 6 billion euros extra than imagined. So you don't even have to go to space. You can just take construction, for example. Construction is very tangible. And the results are always magnified. So you immediately see them. So what's so different between hardware and software engineering? If you think about it, what happened with software engineering is that it evolved because A, we started collaborating on the code. B, the documentation itself, it wasn't really necessary because the code is the documentation if it's written in the right way, so you need the, the right standards. Then on top of that, you can have real-time collaboration. So there's many, many reasons why this happened, but it still hasn't happened to hardware. So I'm going to very briefly run you through hardware design for space missions. For those of you who have no background in it, ideally, you have a concept. You know what you want to do. From there, you start analyzing your mission, how it would be. You start making plans of what kind of spacecraft you'd be needing. It's being developed and integrated and eventually launched. Afterwards, it needs to be operated. Now, there's already complexity there. But then if you look at a space system, it doesn't matter which space system right now you look at. But your electrical power subsystem, for example, would be entirely um, connected to your thermal control subsystem, as it is to all the others. So there's a million connections. Aside from the people working on it, there's a million connections inside the actual systems. So how do we do this right now? There's a methodology called sequential work. So for every one of those subsystems, there's a specialist or there's a team, a dedicated team. And then the work goes from one person to the next. And then this way, you iterate a few times until you get it right. Another way is having a centralized approach in which there is one central person. And then everyone interacts with him. And he keeps track of everything and makes sure that everything fits together. Another approach is the concurrent way. So the concurrent way is when there is a central person still. He's a lead. But everyone else is also connected. So we're looking for something like this to actually design space systems. And everyone agrees that this is the best way forward. However, right now, we still haven't seen the perfect tool to do this with. So ideally, what we want is a tool that can optimize the system for us while we're working on it. Let's just say we're designing the next rocket. We want it to be smart. We want it to be using artificial intelligence to 
optimize for strength, for weight, for whatever. For this to happen, we need to analyze the data that we have. For this to happen, we need to have data that can be explored, that can be searched, that can be, something can be done with it. For this to happen, then you need a certain structure and they need to be connected, all the right links need to be there. So at the very bottom of this pyramid, at the end of the day, where we are right now, is we need to collect and store those data. With hardware engineering, with space systems engineering, right now we still work with exchanging documents. Even if they're digital, they're not truly digital. They're documents. It's not purely digital data you can actually work with immediately. So imagine this, of truth. We have one place where all our data are. And we can work on it through a browser or through whatever, just online and collaborate on it in real time. At the same time, you have complete traceability. You would know exactly why I changed something in uh, two months ago, for example. Automatically, especially as an engineer, as an aerospace engineer myself, honestly, I do not want to spend my, most of my time in documentation. And actually, studies have shown that about 85% of engineers' time is spent on non-engineering work. So there's a lot of documentation, there's a lot of adding data, finding data, changing data, and so on. On top of that, this would be connected to all the software tools that already exist. And then, connecting it to your actual hardware design that we have right now, which is 3D modeling and so on, um, you can get your data from there as well. At the same time, all these things need to be tested, so connecting that to that as well is very important, as well as Sorry. As well as some of the simulation tools, um, because all these things need to be simulated. OK, so you get the point. And then all of a sudden, we go from systems engineering to data-driven systems engineering. Because as soon as you have all those data in one place, you can use your data to actually design your space mission a lot faster and a lot better. So what does this really mean for the future? Let's, look, let's quickly look back at this image. So this guy here, he was always drawing on his board in 2D, right? Non-digital. All of a sudden, a few decades later, someone was like, hey, let's digitize this. It's going to be a lot better, a lot faster. OK, there's a lot of potential failures there because people don't necessarily like innovation. And then all of a sudden, there was someone else who was like, hey, let's draw in 3D. And then whatever 2D you need, you just Make a projection out of it. So this was an entirely different way of working. So imagine if we could do this for hardware. Imagine if we understood how to work in such a way that we can collaborate on things. Right now, we have achieved some very amazing things, as I just proved to you. But those amazing achievements would be even more amazing. And let me illustrate how. Just as an example, Sputnik one of the first satellite missions was developed by a whole government, a whole nation. Right now, the very same mission could be done with 20 students. These are university projects. What software development did for actually the engineering aspect of it, for example, WhatsApp, was developed by just 50 people. And this is serving, I don't even know how many, but a billion or more. At the same time, what is very important is the fact that any one of us would have access to all those data, and any one of us could actually work together. So if I have an interest in space systems, and you have an interest in as well, actually, we can even forget about space systems for a second. If we just have an interest in collaborating on making hardware together, this would be uh, fantastic. So going back to my initial statement, Do you think you fully understand the situation? So anyone who applies the principles of data-driven engineering would fully understand the situation. So in that sense, John Young, if he had a system where he could simply see what the latest calculations were, why things were done in certain ways, and everything was made in such a way that is understandable, traceable, I get the right notification when I need it, then we can actually say that we fully understand the situation. 
So I just want you to look around you. Look at the pointer I'm holding. Touch your phone. Where's your phone? Think of all the systems that you have in your daily life. Think of all the little elements. There's a little screw right here. Think of all the elements that have been put in all these systems and in the amount of hours that have been put combined. The thousands of engineers, the tens of thousands of hours that have been put in simply one little element. And think of all the broken process I just showed you. So with all of this, we still achieve amazing things. But imagine if we applied the right principles and had the right tools. What could we achieve then? And now as a final thought for you. Imagine an agricultural engineer from Nigeria and a farmer from Norway and a data scientist from China. I wonder what they could come up with. Thank you. <laughs>